Testing, one, two, three. Welcome to episode eight of the Island Empire. My name is Jason, and I'm gonna show you a card trick. Scop, Calabre, Hart, Ruit, Her, Pro, Boer. In Sri Lanka, we use Dutch names for the card pack. And by the way, this is my very own, very cool, one of the one and only Sepultura pack that I own. There we have it. Episode 8 of Island Empire. Welcome. This episode was an eye-opener for myself. This period of time in Sri Lankan history I wasn't really that familiar with. And just getting into the research and finding things about this time uh, to talk was a uh, was a kind of a new thing for me as well so let's just deep dive into it how different historical events unfolded and what's our perception about these times and how we can perhaps get a better understanding get a more positive narrative around some of these events that happened and how we can move on from this time and perhaps talk about some challenges that we're facing today as a nation and how we can perhaps gain an understanding or at least an insight from this very fascinating time the dutch ceylon period let's go get it island empire I remember when I was a kid, about six years old, in my parents' old house in Kandy, I used to dig up this old coin, and this coin had three Latin characters on it, V-O-C. Years later, I found out that the V-O-C stands for Vereenigde ost Indische Company, which is United Dutch East India Company, a currency that was minted for the United Dutch East India Company, early 1700s. And this was one of my first memories of the presence of Dutch in Sri Lankan history. And years later, of course, I found more information. And whilst researching for episode 8, I found some new fascinating information. And for example, that card trick that I just showed you before, I just literally found it a couple of weeks ago while researching for the episode. There are many examples, of course, of the Dutch influence and the Dutch heritage in Sri Lankan culture, music and uh, food and, of course, you know, genetics as well. My approach is to understand the timeline from a uh, rather broad perspective and how did they get here, what were the forces that drove them here and what kind of an exchange happened on the island and what kind of a legacy did that time period leave behind? And of course, as always, concluding the episode, I want to talk about what I think we can gain from this period of time and what I think it's relevant and even urgent for us as Sri Lankans and Sri Lankan diaspora. Uh, I'm a New Zealander of Sri Lankan heritage. I grew up in Auckland, New Zealand for most part of my life. So I still feel like I've maintained a very matured connection to Sri Lankan culture. And having this advantage of growing up here, um, another colonial outpost, uh, another culture of, of indigenous people experiencing a very similar experience in many ways to to us in Sri Lanka this was this is what a this was a fascinating experience in itself and hence one of the driving motivations for myself for Island Empire is to to make peace with this fact myself on a personal level as well let's just define kind of a rough timeline for ourselves first thing I want to talk about is how the Dutch arrived in Sri Lanka. Second thing I want to talk about is what kind of an exchange happened within the island with the Dutch and the Sinhalese and also the Tamils in the north as well. 
cooperation and diplomacy was the status quo in this second stage. All right, the third stage is conflict and monopoly. And we're going to talk about how that happened, which leads to our fourth and the final point of social transformation during the Dutch Ceylon period and its obviously lasting legacy and the heritage as well. And concluding the episode, I want to talk about what I think we can gain from this time period and what we can understand, what we can learn and what we can apply to our present time, 2021, as Sri Lankans and Sri Lankan diaspora joining in from around the world. So that's our little roadmap right there. So on the 2nd of June 1603, Admiral Joris van Spielbergen arrived at the court of King Vimaldhermasuria of Kandy. This meeting was said to be very cordial and very warm. And in fact, King Vimaldhermasuria went on to learn Dutch language. And Admiral van Spielbergen left two musicians as a sign of friendship with the king. So at the early stage, at the arrival stage, the uh, two men, obviously united by a shared disdain for the Portuguese. At this time, let's remember from the last episode, the Portuguese were consolidating power in the Indian Ocean, seized the spice trade from the Arabs, and their projected power towards Southeast Asia and Japan. Now, the Dutch entered this whole game of colonialism as a result of a war in Europe with the Portuguese and the Spanish. So the Sinhalese want the Portuguese out of the island. The Dutch want to seize the spice trade from the Portuguese. So these guys were united with similar interests and they agreed to cooperate on military matters. And in 1638, one of the vice commanders of Dutch East India Company, William Jacobs Costa, he gained an audience with the then King Rajasinghe II and they signed what's known as the Candian Treaty, And this treaty enabled the Dutch to project military power and gain control of some of the strategic ports. And sure enough, in the early days, ports like Batikolo and Trincomalee, which were regained from the Portuguese, were given back to the control of Rajasinghe II. But later on, things went sour. The Dutch claimed that the king wasn't keeping his side of the bargain by not paying the enormously overinflated figure that uh, they asked for the uh, military alliance or the military assistance and the Dutch went on to keep the famous Gaul fort in the southern Sri Lankan coast for example. So this awkward fallout between the Dutch and the Sinhalese gave rise to the old Sri Lankan saying of trading ginger for chilies, getting a worse enemy than the one that you have or getting a bad deal. So the Dutch went on to consolidate maritime power around the island across some of the strategic ports like Trincomalee, like Batikolo and Colombo and in the south Gaul as well, completely replacing the Portuguese presence on the island. The Dutch went on to transform the southwestern coastline and in the north Jaffna and Trincomalee unlike the Portuguese period before, which seemed to have been quite an organic process of conflict, no doubt, but also of cooperation that extended for decades, for centuries, as evident in its cultural imprint on our, on our music, on our language, on our genetics as well. Whereas this era is different because there's this clear separation between the low country, the coastal regions of Sri Lanka, and the up country or the highlands of Sri Lanka. There's this stratification happened during this time, which was the key takeaway I personally got for myself by studying for this episode. That there is this rift between the Sinhalese society, creating two different demographic, two different social extremes came from this period of time. And as a person from upcountry, it is important for me to understand the historical context around this event. And I think that helped me to gain 
a little bit more about myself and a little bit more about ourselves as a nation and as a culture. Hello, Jason from the future here. While I was editing this episode 8, I found this book, an old translation of a original Tamil chronicle called Yalpan Vaipavma, which stands for the Chronicles of Jaffna. Now, Jaffna is the, uh, the northern peninsula of the island of Sri Lanka, which is the homeland, the heartland of the Sri Lankan Tamil culture. Now, this is totally random, but when I picked up this book yesterday and started reading the, the preface, the writer or the translator of the, uh, the book, a Sinhalese person called Mohandaram K. H. The Silva, he reckons that until 17th or until the 16th century, there had been no original Tamil history book or a history or a story regarding the Jaffna Peninsula or the story of the Tamil Sri Lankan people, right? And interestingly, in 1736, the Dutch governor of Jaffna commissioned a scholar by the name of Meilwagen Pulver to write this very book in original Tamil, Yalpan Vaipavamal, and this is a Sinhalese translation of that chronicle. And it is interesting for me to understand as a researcher, as a explorer of history of Sri Lanka, that it was a Dutch governor who led this contribution of history to Sri Lankan Tamil people and of course to Sri Lankan history at large as well because this book is fascinating. It relates the story of the Sri Lankan Tamil people from Tamil perspective. And that's me. I'm just going to put this story in the episode right now. Island Empire. Let's get it. So, in the lowlands, the Dutch control all of the strategic harbours now. Raja Singh II up in the mountainous region in central Sri Lanka is essentially trapped. Can't reach out to any potential allies in South India, for example. And this creates this system where essentially two different, slightly different Sinhalese cultures emerge. In the low country, in the coastal areas, you have these urbanized, westernized, uh, creolized, Eurasian sort of culture emerging among the Sinhalese. And this is where we need to plug this word. The Ceylon Burgers is a unique group of people of Dutch and Sinhalese heritage. Here in 1700s, on the island of Sri Lanka, there's this unique community of people of mixed heritage gaining social mobility in this very unique set of historical circumstances. I think it's a fascinating event that deserves to be studied more, that deserves to be understood better, I think. There was a massive migration of Dutch burger folk out of Sri Lanka in the uh, late 70s when the political environment in Sri Lanka started to assume a more authoritarian, more intolerant kind of a tone. Many of the Berger families left Sri Lanka and migrated to Australia, to Canada and places uh, like that. And personally, I think that was a loss to Sri Lanka. To have an entire minority migrate out of Sri Lanka because of a changing political and social environment was a great loss. Some very common Ceylon Berger surnames would be Hendrix, Andres, Bartholomeus, and Bastians. The Baila King, Walter Wally Bastians, was of Dutch burger descent. Because of their mixed ancestry and being bilingual, many of the burgers rose to high positions uh, within society, within government, and in business. Many of them were quite affluent. Which is why I think the burger exodus in Sri Lanka in the late 70s. It's an embarrassing episode in our history. I think we need to at least go and acknowledge this.
monopoly of the cinnamon trade, the VOC went on to completely dominate the cinnamon cultivation and production. The demand for cinnamon in Europe was nearly impossible to meet. And at some point during this time, cinnamon by weight was more valuable than gold. Implementation of the Roman Dutch law. Now what the heck is Roman Dutch law? Well, it is the law that they were practicing in Holland, of course. And this goes back to the Roman Emperor Justinian, who imposed the Roman law for the Germanic barbaric people back then, according to Romans. And this law survived and later implemented in Ceylon as, as the way things were done. Skilled bureaucrats, the Dutch, and, and great bankers and, and financiers and, and great, great navigators and, and business folk, they understood the value of the rule of law, the primacy of, of law. They understood the value of that to create business and to, and to prosper and to create abundance. For economy to happen, the rule of law must be solid. Another significant event that happens around this time is the introduction of the Protestant Church to Sri Lanka. Remember, by this time, Catholicism is the Christianity in Sri Lanka, right? For hundreds of years. It was entrenched in the Sinhalese community, particularly around the coastal communities. Other than that, the law also shapes culture as well. Now, in feudal Ceylon, it was quite common, for example, practices like polygamy, which I guess is understandable. Here's a tropical island, many diseases like malaria and fevers and all sorts of other, other things that can kill you. But of course, from the VOC's point of view, by implementing the Roman Dutch law, by promoting and by promoting the reformed church and actively suppressing the, uh, the Portuguese cultural and Roman Catholic uh, religious practices. This period started to create this rift between the Sinhalese society, the westernized, urbanized uh, Sinhalese folk in the uh, the coastal area, and then you have the culturally conservative, rural, traditional, upcountry, highland folk. What can we gain from this? What's the insight? What is the lesson here? Well, Island Empire is that place where I dig into history and understand the events and the emotions that were attached to these events. How can we create a broad timeline? How can we get a bird's eye view on our history and the progression of events? And how can we understand ourselves a little bit better? And, of course, pose questions such as, can we begin to separate event from the emotion? and get much more objective, historical understanding of these things. And what forces drove movements like colonialism and look forward in a different perspective, with a different narrative. Can we process our historic timeline and get a much more positive, empowered and healthy understanding of ourselves? And obviously my answer is affirmative. In the last episode, we discussed the Ceylon Portuguese era and its fascinating cultural heritage and the reasons why it happened the way it happened, the contributing factors, namely European Renaissance that happened 500 years ago, created this explosive event, an explosion of knowledge and ideas and sharing technologies and pouring energy and effort into maritime technology to commerce to business to banking and culture and music some of the greatest paintings and works of art comes from the renaissance period i think it's important for us to understand how the europeans arrived portugal is a very small country and netherlands is literally below sea level compared to some of the neighbors in europe they were at a disadvantage and yet they did what they were doing, which was uh, fishing, trading, financing, banking, and more significantly, investing in maritime technology. The Dutch were defined by their existence, living below sea level, 
and with this understanding that they constantly need to be a people that is connected with the ocean they have this unique relationship with the ocean an island empire is this place where i kind of begin to question myself saying is it okay for me to think like an isolated person in the highlands against these large global dynamics or is it worthwhile for me to understand these large global dynamics and gain a better understanding of my place in the world i mean if i had a choice i don't want sri lanka to be like a tourist show what i'm envisioning for sri lanka is more like a arab emirates kind of a style future what i'm envisioning for sri lanka is not just to be a tourist haven and there's nothing wrong with that it's great but to think like the voc or the united arab emirates or singapore and come to a relationship with the ocean and this is coming from someone who grew up in the mountains we need to project ourselves vigorously back to the oceans we need to go back to the ports we need to be a maritime nation again and i think there is tremendous value in doing that and i think it's personally it's urgent already some ports are disappearing right in front of our eyes so past that dutch it's island empire time